Let's, uh, let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 6, where we're continuing our study. And this morning, we're talking about the secret life of the believer. The secret life of the believer. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by reading the text itself, and we'll read the first 18 verses, <clears throat> and then we'll consider its application to our life this morning. Matthew, chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast... Put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture this morning, and we're so eager to learn from you. We're so excited to, to even be opening this book and to understand and recognize that we're receiving a revelation from you that is living and active and powerful and that you want to actually conform and transform our lives by this word this morning. And so I pray that not only would we be challenged, but we'd be encouraged and blessed and set free by your living word. And Holy Spirit, we need your help. I know I need your help. I've prepared, I've done my homework, but Lord, unless you build your house, the labor is in vain and we don't want to do anything in vain today. So God, by your spirit, would you work and pour out your power and your love upon us and meet the need of every man and woman and young person here today according to the riches of your glory in Christ. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. One of the most attractive components of the Christian life outside of actually having our sins forgiven and knowing that we have an eternal hope and a future in Christ, at least for me, is that my life changed because I could become a transparent person. Prior to becoming a Christian, I was hidden. I wasn't necessarily always the person I was appearing to be. I still am growing in that, but prior to knowing Christ, I was always trying to figure out who I was supposed to be. I didn't really know, and I didn't have a sense of security in my own life about my identity. And so I was kind of sampling and testing different types of lifestyles I might lead in order to find the person that I thought I was supposed to be. It reminds me of a story about Robert Redford that I came across. One day he was walking into a hotel lobby, and of course when a, when a movie star like that walks around, it's like everybody's looking and trying not to say too much, but a woman kind of couldn't contain herself, and just as Robert Redford uh, stepped in an elevator and the doors were just about to close, uh, she couldn't help herself, and she says, are you the real Robert Redford? And uh, there was a slight pause as the doors began to close, and he said, only when I'm alone. Sometimes people are like that. The only time they can really be themselves is when they're alone. And one of the most satisfying things about being a Christian is that God is calling us into a life where we can be ourselves anywhere we go and have absolute freedom and transparency. And the freedom it brings is, 
is difficult to describe except for those of you that know that same freedom in Christ. And I think there's a principle there that essentially what you are in private is the true measure of who you really are. What you are in private is the true measure of your spiritual life. And we find in the text of Scripture here something that almost seems to be a contradiction because Jesus is advocating secrecy. But I want to suggest to you his purpose for the secrecy is so that we can be free, so that we can become the people that we are really meant to be, so that we're not doing things with the wrong motives. And it's kind of interesting because in Matthew chapter 5, 16, Jesus just got finished saying, let your, let your good deeds be evident to all for the glory of God. And now he's saying, hide those good deeds. Don't let people know what's going on. And it almost seems like a contradiction, but it's not. What Jesus is saying is that our motives are everything. Our motives are really important. And if your desire is to honor God and glorify God and bring attention to his name, then go ahead and let your light shine. But if you're struggling with, a, with self-promotion or a desire to be seen or, or, or for people to be impressed, then make those deeds secret. Keep them private so that you can develop a, a passion for doing things for God alone. And as I was preparing this message, I, I had this uh, very uh, humorous talk with my wife uh, because I started talking to her about things that we've done in the past where we have tried to appear just a little bit better than we are. And one of those areas that I shared with my wife was uh, I, I, I run, and I run from my house up to Loop Road and back. And uh, so it's not my favorite thing to do, but it's good exercise, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a short way to get the, the workout that I want to have in my day and try to do it a few times a week. And so I go up there. But, you know, when I was younger, I would go on these runs and I would be timing myself. And every time I had to go a little faster and I had a whole routine of, okay, I have a slow day and then I have some days that I, I sprint as fast as I can. And, you know, I was really trying to, you know, I still had a mindset that I could somehow improve, you know. And now I'm 51. And now when I'm 51, it's like a really good run is not by time. It's if I come home. You know, that's the success, as if I actually make it back to my house. is like, I've, <laughs> you know, I made it. But I still find in myself, not so much anymore, but even up until a few years ago, that there, were, there would be times I just didn't feel good, and I would be like dogging it. And I, wasn't, I just thought, I'm just going to walk this hill. And so I'd find myself, I'd just walk this hill, and, you know, the times in the evenings that I'd run, there are not a lot of cars going up there. All the tourists are kind of done for the day. I'm walking up the hill, but I can hear a car coming in the background. It's coming around the corner, and you know what I do, right? Come on. I start running. Why? I don't know. I'm just so full of pride, you know. I, I just can't be seen dogging it, you know. It's like the old man. Look at the poor old man. He, let's stop and give him CPR. He needs some water, you know. So I get back up, and I'm just... And then as soon as the car goes over the hill, it's like, you know. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I was, uh, I was getting ready to give the message. And um, usually I'm right up in the back over here as they're doing the, the final announcements and the last worship song. And, and I really love our, I love worshiping and I love our worship teams. We miss Bruce, but these other teams, God's raising them up. And it's just really exciting to see their abilities and how they're leading us. But uh, a couple years ago, I was, I was back there, and usually I just am going at it and loving and worshiping and everything, but I got a few things that I got to do just before I get up here. I got to get, I make sure I got a last little swig of water. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that my mic is on and the, the mute button is off, so when I come up, I'm not fumbling with that. I'm making sure my notes are open, doing a few things, my pants are zipped up. I mean, that's important, you know. <laughs> Uh, and so I'm taking care of all of these little things before I get up here. And the last thing I did just before I came up is I kind of just went like that to just kind of make sure everything was in place, you know. And the, and, and the, the guys that, took, that received the offering and take it to the, the office, they walk right past right at that moment when I was going like this. And something in me said, raise your hand. So I went like that, you know, like a... <laughs> you know. It's more like this, you know that kind of emotion, you know? And I got so convicted right on the spot, I thought, you hypocrite, you phony. You are, you make me sick, I said to myself. I didn't have a mirror there, but if I did, I wouldn't be doing that with my hair and I wouldn't have been caught like that, you know? But I share that with you because there's still this, this desire uh, to somehow be seen and to be approved of and somehow to look better. You know, and what, I, what I've discovered about myself, and, and you know yourself as well, 
but I don't expect to look a lot better than I am. I just want to look a little better than I am. We're all reaching to be just a little better in the eyes of people than we really are. And what I can tell you is that Jesus wants to set us free in such a way that we can be who we really are and be satisfied with that. And that we can be genuinely ourselves at home and at work, in the car, wherever we are. We're of the same cloth. We're the same person. We, we don't, we're we're a seam, living a seamless life. And so as we, as we look at this text this morning, I have empathy for the Pharisees and the teachers because my heart might not be quite as hard as theirs was at this point, but I have every potential to be like them. And there's something in me that, that, uh, that sometimes pursues that life, and Jesus keeps calling me to a higher standing and a more wonderful freeing life than the crippling imprisonment that comes with trying to be someone that you're really not. And so he covers three areas of the areas of, of giving and praying and fasting, three spiritual disciplines that are very important for the Christian life, but were being abused by the teachers and the religious leaders of that day to draw attention to themselves. And so Jesus begins in verse 1 and says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness or your almsgiving or your good deeds before men to be seen by them. And this is something that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they had a ravenous hunger to be approved of and receive the praise of men. It was their besetting sin. It was their life-dominating sin. In fact, it was so bad that this is what Jesus said about them in Matthew 23, verse 5. He says, everything they do is done for men to see. Everything is done for men to see. Jesus says real clearly, if you do what they do and live how they live, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven for those deeds. doesn't mean that you won't be rewarded for other things that you had the right motivation for. It's not like he's, he's, he's saying you're no good, but he's saying those acts that you do for the pleasure and praise of men rather than for the pleasure and praise of God will not receive a reward. And so he says in advice, so when you give to the needy, don't announce it with the trumpets at the, as the hypocrites do. This, this word hypocrite is very interesting because it's where we get our word actor from. Originally, a hypocrite was not, didn't have a, a bad reputation. A hypocrite was somebody that performed in theater, or we would say a movie star like a Robert Redford. He's a hypocrite, not because he's, he's evil or bad, but because he is assuming a character, not his own. And in the spiritual realm, when a person is a hypocrite, they are taking on this persona of spiritual life and morality and ethics that really doesn't belong to them. It's beyond where they are. They're not striving for it and, and being a hypocrite, but they are pretending and they are being a hypocrite. And so the Lord says, don't announce it as they do. Now, we don't know if they really announced it. I think there's some hyperbole in here, including the don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I mean, those, are, those are, are phrases that are designed to help us understand the principle that Jesus is trying to get across. But he says these guys are announcing it, and they're doing it in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. And Jesus says they have the reward in full. It's like that's all they're going to get, that little bit of, or, wow, I could never be like them. That's it. That's the reward that they get, nothing from God. There's a story about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. You guys may know the story. I'll just summarize it briefly. In the early days of the church, there was such a movement of the Spirit of God, and there was a lot of persecution that was going on, and there was so much activity of God's power evangelizing and reaching tens of thousands of people in just a matter of a, a, a month, a few days, that there were people that were in need financially. And so God put it on the hearts by his spirit to, in the, to the people in the church that some of them who had more wealth and more assets would offer that so that the disciples could distribute it to those people that were genuinely in need. And so Ananias and Sapphira were obviously a couple that were moved by the spirit of God. And the spirit of God said, sell a certain piece of property and give the proceeds to the disciples for the distribution to the needy within the church. And so Ananias and Sapphira said, we will do it. But then, after considering it for a little while, they said, geez, that's a lot of money. And we could probably use a little bit of that. And they made an agreement together to go to the disciples, sell the property, and present to them not the full amount, 
but to pretend that it was the full amount and hold back some for themselves. And so they went through with this, uh, with this scheme of theirs. Well, they got busted because the Spirit of the Lord spoke to Peter and, and told him, which is like, that's, that's bad. You know, when, when you're trying to get away with something and God tells the pastor what you've done before you even know that anyone else knows, and he confronts you with it, and that's what Peter did. And he said, how could you do this and lie to the Spirit of God? And God struck them dead on the spot for that. And we look at that and we think, whoa, you know, I mean, the truth is, is that they did something amazing. They sold a piece of property and they gave it. And Peter said, you know, it was in your control. You could have kept it, not given it. You could have done anything you wanted, but it's a lie. And I want to suggest to you that the lie was trying to look incrementally better than they really were. They would have looked great just for having given what they wanted to and said, we're not going to give it all but because but, we need this amount for, you know, down payment on this or we've got to pay some bills. But it was the intention to be a hypocrite, to be an actor and present something that they really weren't in order to receive a little bit more praise from the men and women in the early church. And so... I see this all the time, and if you've been in ministry any length of time, you've seen it where there are fundraisers uh, for a building program or something like that, and it's very public, and it's like, who's going to give $10,000? And okay, we've got five people, business people that are giving five. Can those five come up? And I, there's a, I've heard of a church that, uh, that at the end of the year, they take the top 10 tithers of the church, and they put them in the bulletin, have them come up front. Clap, 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 ooh, big tithers, you know. And then they get to go out on a special dinner, very expensive special dinner with the pastor and his wife as a reward. And what Jesus is saying is that when people do these things, that's all the reward they're going to get. And what, you know, ob the obvious truth here is that God will reward you in a far greater way than the applause and, and uh, having your name in a bulletin on one Sunday service uh, and his intention is to do something far greater. But there's something in us that, that moves toward that, and we have to be wary of it, and that's what Jesus is trying to get across. And so he says instead in verse 3, when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that it, that, that it can be in secret. Now, the Bible tells us all over the Scriptures, Old and New Testament, we're to be generous with the poor and with the needy. But Jesus says, in contrast to these religious leaders that were using giving as a platform for self-promotion, he says, do it secretly so that you can tame this flesh within you so that you're doing it only for me. Because if you're not interested in doing it for secret, in secret, then you're not interested in doing it for the Lord. You're doing it for the praise of men. But if you can give or pray or fast for Christ alone then that gift is received, and that flesh is being tamed. And so he goes on and says, Then your father, if you give in this manner in secret, he who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What's the reward? Well, we're going to have joy in participating with God. We're going to have satisfaction in meeting a genuine need. We're going to have the thrill of pleasuring the heart of God because he's told us how to do this. And we're also going to have the anticipation of future reward, not only because of what Jesus says here, but in Isaiah, in uh, uh, Proverbs 19, 17, it says, he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and God will reward him for what he has done. He goes on to another illustration in verse 5, and he's talking about praying. And he says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray. Oh, I just was thinking to myself, oh, if it only stopped there. They should have just put a period there. With an exclamation point, that would have been a great thing. What a, what a wonderful thing for someone, or especially God, to say about you. They love to pray. But unfortunately, it doesn't stop there. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. One of the uh, traditions and requirements of Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law and the religious leaders is that they prayed three times a day. Uh, that goes all the way back, by the way, to Daniel and even prior to that. Uh, but this, this commitment, and it's, it's not just a commitment in Christendom. Even the Muslims have prayer three times a day, and they're very religious about it. And they ring a bell or blow a horn or a shofar or something in every one of these world religions, and they immediately stop where they are and they pray. Now, they were supposed to do this in the synagogue. They were supposed to do this in the temple. But 
they could arrange by proper planning to not quite make it to the synagogue when the shofar was blown, not quite make it to the temple. And they could calculate that if they took a certain pace and left their home at a certain time, that they could actually find themselves on a very busy street corner when that shofar was blown and when they would find themselves on a street corner or a market. And immediately when that happened, they would stop right where they were, hurry, 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 looking like they're really trying to get there, flowing robes, beautiful garments and books, and, but they have to stop because now it's a time of prayer. Nine in the morning, 12 noon, three in the afternoon. And they would immediately, religiously, wonderfully stop. And they would lift their hands to God, sometimes kneeling, and they would cry out to God with a loud voice and, and, and go off in their prayer in the midst of the hustle and bustle of the city for the very purpose, the singular purpose, of drawing attention to themselves for the praise of men. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. As I was thinking about this, I was... I was realizing that if I have trouble praying by myself in private, then any public prayers I offer are probably not for God and to God primarily. They're probably for other people. So if I can't find myself in a place of excitement and joy praying privately with the Lord, and I don't do much of that, but when I get in a public forum and I can go, then my prayers, even though in my mind they're probably for God, I may be deceiving myself and actually praying for the ears of people rather than for the ears of my king. And so I, got, I really have thought about these things, and I've been convicted and, and really crying out to God for these things so that I can be a man of, of, of seamless integrity in my life. I'm, I'm never going to get there completely. I know that. And none of you, I know it's so disappointing to tell you this because I like to be a real encourager, but none of you are going to get there either where your life is completely seamless in integrity. But I want to be moving in that direction. And so what it's prompted me to want to do is to listen to the counsel of Jesus Christ and develop a secret life so that my public life can be seamless and that I'm of a, a, a singular integrity and authenticity which brings me freedom in every quadrant of my life. And so in contrast to these, these religious leaders, Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, and then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, Jesus isn't denigrating or prohibiting public prayer. He's not saying, oh, don't do that. I've, I've actually seen people that say, well, I don't pray, I don't pray out loud in, pe in public because, you know, of the Sermon on the Mount. And that's a misunderstanding of the text. What Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to shape and cultivate our character so that whatever we do, it's for the glory of God. And sometimes secrecy brings us to a place of understanding what's really at the core of our life because if we don't want to pray as believers and we don't want to fast as believers and we don't want to be generous to the needy as believers, if it can't be seen by people, then we have a problem. I've got a problem. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a plumb line. I guess I should go this way. It's a plumb line, not a plumb line. It's a plumb line to help us recognize the true content and the true character of this relationship with God. And so he encourages us to be rewarded by God who sees these things done in secret. And he says, don't be like the pagans. They babble and they, they think that by their many words they're going to be heard, vain repetitions of the pagans. We have evidence of this in the Old Testament, but by the way, uh, when we have the prophets of Baal with this big contest with Elijah in, in 1 Kings 18, and, uh, and they go from 6 in the morning until 12 noon babbling, trying to get their, their false god's attention. Of course, nothing happened. We also know in the book of Acts uh, when uh, in Ephesus, the worshipers of Artemis in chapter 19, they went off in unison, it says, for two hours, great is Artemis, God of the Ephesians. That's vain babbling. But again, we can't, uh, we can't just point at other people because in Protestantism, we have that potential as well as, as, well as Catholicism uh, with the Hail Marys or the prayer books of the Protestant uh, movement. And those things can all be helpful to a certain degree, but what God is looking for in our prayer life is intimacy with Him and relationship. And these rote, repetitious things remove and distance ourselves from God. They don't generate and they don't promote intimacy. 
And what prayer is about is divine connection and pouring out of our heart with integrity and authenticity before the King of kings and the Lord of lords who knows everything about us and loves us anyway. And so he invites us into a real spiritual journey with the real loving God. And all these other things are distractions to that process. And so he says, avoid these things. And he says, your father who knows what you need will provide it for you. I love that. He's, he's actually saying that God already knows what you need. And he's already got it positioned and ramped up. He's just waiting for the intimacy to be developed. You ever wonder why God doesn't give us things in advance? Because sometimes the only way he can get our attention or invite us into prayer is because of some crisis. Well, I'm not against crises. I need them myself. I'll be honest with you. I, I love when things go wrong because they help me so much in my prayer life. They really do. I've tried to emulate and copy intensity in prayer when everything is going well as it did, you know, that same intensity as when things were rough. I can't, I've never been able to duplicate it, you know? So I just throw up my hands and say, well, well, Lord, you know my heart. I, I, you know my love for you. And when those moments come, I'll be intense again. I'm still intense with the Lord, but there's something about trial that brings us to the table. And God knows that. And so he says, look, I will, I've already got the answer for you. I want you to come so that we can have intimacy and friendship. And so it says in Isaiah 65, 24, before they call, I will answer. And while they're still speaking, I will hear. This is your God. This is your Savior speaking. He knows what you need, and he's inviting you into this intimate relationship. And so then Jesus begins to expound one of the most famous pieces of literature in world history, we refer to it as the Lord's Prayer. And he says, so this is then how you should pray. A couple of things I want to note before we get into it is that Jesus never prayed this prayer himself because this prayer involves the confession of sin, which, of course, Jesus was never guilty of. The second thing that's notable about this prayer is that all of the pronouns are in the plural form, us, we, our. Not one I, not one me in the prayer which really points to the fact that God is looking for our prayer life to, to have a corporate integrity mindset, thinking beyond ourselves, uh, a heart of interdependent intercession for other people and a global view of the body of Christ. But he begins in verse 9 by saying a very simple thing, and I've I just kind of labeled this for you, a prayer for God's person, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be be your name. It's a recognition of the power and the authority and the majesty of God. A lot of other prayers, by the way, in the Bible start this way. One of my favorites is in uh, 2 Chronicles 20, and it's uh, beginning in verse 6, where Jehoshaphat prays. And this is what he says, O Lord, God of our fathers, you are not the God, uh, 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 are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations and power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. You see what, what, what Jesus is saying and what Jehoshaphat models are saying, start off with recognizing the greatness and the majesty of your God and the hallowedness of him. Even as Isaiah, when he was, when he was caught up and he saw the heavens open and, and he saw the train of the Lord, of the, of the train of the Lord's robe filling the temple and he saw the seraphs and they were crying out, holy, holy, holy is our God almighty. And there's something powerful when you, when you recognize who God is. And the, the magnificence of our king and his hallowedness and the separateness of him and the beauty of who he is. Boy, I tell you, you want to make your problems look like midgets in seconds? Look upon Christ and recognize him for who he is. Verse 10, he begins to pray for God's program. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the very same message, by the way, that Jesus was preaching in Matthew chapter 4, 17, he says, the kingdom of God is near. And in the Greek, it means approaching, but the root word means to squeeze. And so Jesus is saying this, that this kingdom is coming. It's squeezing upon you. We're running out of time. And never before in history has it seemed so apparent that Jesus is at the door and he's coming for his church. But there's a recognition of the kingdom of God. We know it, it, it involves Christ's reign, 
It in involves Christ's citizenry that we're a part of, and it involves Christ's realm. Now, right now, we have his rule and his, the citizenry, but we don't have the realm yet. That's coming when the new heaven and the new earth are, are created. But the first two components are in place. And the third component is going to come when Christ comes for the church and wraps up all of these things that are recorded for us prophetically in the book of Revelation. And so such a good reminder as you're praying, never ever forget that your king is coming and that we're at the doorstep. So right away out of the gate, Jesus says, do two things when you pray. Recognize the magnificence of who you're talking to and remember in the midst of the trials and the problems that you're almost home. Those two things by themselves, it's like, okay, prayer done. All my problems just got resolved. Everything seems manageable now in light of who God is and the fact that this isn't going to go on forever. But Jesus goes on and he says in, in verse 11, pray for God's provision. And he says very simply, give us our daily bread. A, a, a real reference to the time in Exodus when manna was given and it was literally daily bread. You had to collect it daily so that there would be a dependence on God. And now, especially here on Kauai because of hurricanes, we got a month's supply of food. I mean, we could, we could feed the neighborhood. Most of us in our houses could uh, easy a week of food. I mean, ne not go to any store and yeah, we'd be eating some stuff we're probably not real excited about in cans and things like that. It's not our favorite, but we could easily live for a week. So our heart of gratitude has been diminished. We're not an agrarian society anymore, but it still behooves the believer to be thankful at meals. And, and I'm a big advocate of praying at meals. It's not, it's not a big deal except for the fact that it, what it does is an expression. It's not a religious event. It's a moment to tell God, I can't believe I get to eat today three times. Now I'm on my third meal, and look at the preparation. I'm praying for my wife and thanking her, and I'm thinking about the boats that it had to come over on and the people that grew it and the hardship and the, the labor to get this meal in front of me. And Jesus says, pray for that with thanksgiving. And then he says in verse 12, pray for God's pardon. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. There, there are two simple realities I want to share with you briefly here. The first, based on this passage, is that God, by virtue of this prayer being a daily prayer, and it's not a rote prayer, he's just saying these components would be helpful in your prayer time. So don't, don't pray the Lord's Prayer religiously, though there's nothing wrong with praying it, but remember, we're, at, we're after intimacy, not a method. And he says that we are to pray for our daily food. So we're praying this prayer, this Lord's Prayer, as a daily prayer. All these things should be a daily component of our life. Which leads me to the conclusion that if he's saying that we need to ask for forgiveness for our sins or our debts or our wrongdoings, and, and also to do that in such a way as we've forgiven others, then he says we've got to do this every day, which leads me to the conclusion that, lo and behold, that Jesus actually knows, that God the Father knows that we probably aren't going to make it through one day without some sin in our life. I know that's shocking. I know some of you want to, want to argue the point with me afterwards, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. But the truth is, is that when we're really honest, not just about what we do or say, but what we think and how we feel and the attitudes and everything, we can't make it through a day without violating something of the kingdom's principles. And Jesus knows this. And so he says, ask for forgiveness. I, I like Bill Bright. He was the founder and uh, president of Campus Crusade, one of the most, I mean, hands down, had more people come to Christ through his ministry than any person in human history. Billy Graham, Paul, anybody, bar none, Bill Bright. And he made it a point every day because of this prayer to ask for forgiveness as a part of his prayer life every single day. It also tells me that other people are going to sin every day. Even, I know, I know it's crazy, even Christians. And I know, you're, even your spouse, I know, unbelievable. And your kids, Shocking. What this tells me is that we need to be prepared to not only ask for forgiveness, but grant forgiveness as a normal reality of our life. And some of you have turned this kind of reconciliation into like an anniversary event. You know, you've turned it into like once a month when the moon is full, I'll, I'll, re I'll repent. No, and men especially, we need to be leading the way and saying, no, we're going to lead the way on daily repentance. Let me